Today we're going to do a number of things. Uh, I want to go back and finish the slides from the last lecture. Um, I also think it might be worth actually reviewing some of the slides that I did cover uh, towards the end because I think I was rushing a little bit. Um, I've also got a handful of new slides, um, not very many, but it's something else that I wanted to talk about. I just posted these to vSpace about half an hour ago. I apologize I didn't get them together last night. Um, I also want to talk, um, there's a, a slideshow from National Geographic about slums in Mumbai that I thought we might take a look at as well. Um, housekeeping matters. Yesterday I got an email from the department reminding me that the instructor drop deadline is actually this coming Tuesday. When is the student drop deadline? Do you have any idea? Friday of next week? Of this week? It, that seems way too early. Pardon? The early drop deadline. After you have to pay. Oh, wow. OK. This is like checking bags on airlines. Um, so what this means is that on Monday, when I sit down with the GSIs, we are going to look over the list of people who are actually enrolled in the class and compare that to the list of people who have come to section. Um, the, the wait list has shrunk, but not very much. It's still in the ballpark of 35, 40 people. So if we find numerous people who have enrolled in the class but have not come to section and have not explained their absence from section um, on Monday or Tuesday, I will drop those students um, in order to make room for people who are on the wait list and have been coming to section. Does that make sense? Now, presumably, if there are people who are not coming to the class but are enrolled, they're not here right now. So they're not getting this announcement from me. Um, presumably, this is nothing but good news for everyone who's in the room right now. But I did nonetheless want to uh, clarify that. Are there any questions about that? OK. Um, let's start with this slideshow. From National Geographic. No, wrong thing. That's the one I want. There we go. I'm not sure whether this is going to advance on its own or whether I'm going to need to advance it myself. Um, this is from, what's the issue? February 2000. No, that's current issue, February 2010. I'll, I'll find the date of this if you'd like. It's from about a year and a half ago. And as you can see here, the, the sort of overall headline, as Mumbai booms, the poor of its notorious Darabi slum find themselves living in some of India's hottest real estate. Um, I read somewhere recently, I don't think it was in Davis, that uh, office space in Mumbai which is priced how? How is office space priced in large cities, you know? Per square foot or per square meter, depending on the system being used. So this is not like per acre. This is per square foot. The office space in Mumbai is apparently the most expensive office space in the world, more expensive even than Manhattan or Tokyo or London or Paris. Um, as Mumbai has boomed, uh, areas on the edges of it or close to downtown that have been previously slums, as pictured here, um, are becoming the object of investors' interest. And there are pitched battles between both investors and city officials, government officials, who want to see these lands transformed into more formal and more lucrative uses, um, and the people living in these slums, often you know, hundreds of thousands of them. And part of the interest of this slideshow or these photographs from National Geographic, apart from the fact that National Geographic reliably provides great photographs, is that it gives a better sense, I think, of what life is actually like in this slum. This particular slum has become the object of considerable international attention um, because of the sort of pitched, well, the extreme circumstances, the extreme uh, value of the real estate and the pressures to develop it on the one side, and the extreme size and longevity and sort of intensity of the habitation uh, of the folks living in the slum. So as we work our way through these pictures, and there are captions at the bottom, if city planners prevail, high-rise residential blocks and industrial parks will replace the dense web of metal roof homes and shops in Darby. Bisected by 60 feet road, that's the name of the road, the slum borders a mangrove swamp and the upscale Bondra neighborhood to the north. That 60-foot road through the middle of it is you know, a sort of normal city street or, or major city street and artery that happens to cut right through the middle of this. Now, see how quickly the Air Bears connection can provide us the links. Here, here's a, a street scene. Why is this not tabbing down for me? Oh, come along. How, many, how much gymnastics am I going to have to do here? A young girl strolls along a leaky water pipe through Darby's industrial district. Oh, this is going to take longer than it's worth if my things will not work for me. Maybe I should just shrink this and we can see them smaller. Yes, I will have to shrink it. Come along. One of the points that's made very nicely in this uh, photo essay is that the folks in this area, it's not like these people are just sitting around doing nothing. They're actually large businesses and industries located in the middle of this slum, industries that employ many thousands of people and that have been there in some cases for a great deal of time. Um, this is a, a man pounding old paint chips into fine powder, which will be reconstituted into paint again. This is not ideal. At one point, I had this working just like a slideshow. Is that what that's going to do? No. Folks doing laundry in a pool of sewer runoff. I would love to find a nice, neat, tidy solution to this here. This is one of the businesses, a boy standing amidst um, pottery made at a traditional work of the Kumbar caste, set up their communal day pits and kilns in the 1930s. So they've been making pots in the middle of Darvi for the better part of a century. Some of these photos don't seem to like to come in, or come in only very slowly. Oh, this is not working as well as I'd like it to. I apologize. All right, maybe that's enough for now. Look, it goes on and on and on. All right, so much for my attempt at high technology and bouncing between various things. Um, let, me, let me find you the, the date on this in case you'd like to look at it further. So it looks like it's probably May 2007. Oh, never mind. OK, 
I give up. Let's come back to the end of the previous lecture. You remember I was suggesting that this that we use Davis to try to derive some lessons that you might find useful in putting together your research papers later in the semester. And I was talking about regions as patterns, patterns whose shape is the result both of what is out there in the world, so to speak, objectively, empirically real that we can see, but also in part a function of how we look at them, or what we call or perceive to be a pattern, that in turn being dependent on the scale at which we observe these things, right? So when we look, as those photographs did, at a scale that's very, very localized, individual people, individual households, or streets, we see things that are invisible if looked at from a different scale, say the scale of Mumbai as a whole, in which case that slum shrinks to a sort of region or piece of the city, and the details of the lives of people living there sort of aren't so visible, fall out of view. And I suggested that these patterns should not be treated as somehow static or pre-given. They are not simply fixed and natural, but the result of historical processes playing themselves out over time. And I suggested that, again, as with, as with regions, we sort of can't avoid thinking about processes in terms of spatial and temporal scales, specific to those scales. These are abstracted. Patterns and processes are both abstractions that we generate in our heads from the realities we look at in order to try to make sense of them, right? And putting these pieces together, space and time, and thinking about the way they are, in a sense, embedded within each other. So the very small scale or discrete momentary events seem as though we can think of them as sort of inside of longer time periods, larger areas, um, in these sort of concentric rings. Now, there are some problems with thinking about it in such a neat, tidy, nested kind of way, but it's still a useful way to sort of start the process of trying to make sense of these patterns and processes. And we can put units of time on them, just as we put units of space on the, on the regions, and we can then try to put them together and think about them in their interactions. Now, maybe we can take a few minutes here. Everyone's read the first three chapters of Davis, correct? Perhaps as an exercise, if you could get together with your neighbor, a couple of neighbors, and try to think about Davis and what you've read so far in Davis in these terms. For some reason, my laser pointer thing is not working. It may be that my battery is no longer powerful enough. Um, try to think about what are the processes that Davis has sketched out, at least initially. What are the scales of those processes? What are the temporal periods of those processes? How many of them can you identify? Some of them are political. Some of them are economic. Perhaps each example that he provides is located in a specific place. But if you start seeing the same pattern or the same process at a bunch of different places at the same basic period of time, it becomes tempting to try to think of processes that are somehow operating over larger spatial scales than just those individual cities, right? So take a few minutes and try to sort of schematically start thinking about what Davis has said about slums in terms of this framework. Could you do that for me? Like five minutes, and then we'll talk about it.
OK. How should we start? Who wants to volunteer a process and a time, space time scale at which it's operating? Yeah. OK. Right, right. OK, so there, there's a very, that's a nice place to start. And it is where David starts, right? It's an interesting move from a sort of uh, narrative point of view or, or rhetorical point of view. He starts right at the beginning with what is essentially like an, an event at a household scale, right? The birth of a child or the movement of a family from the countryside into the city. And yeah, that's a very localized, discrete event. But his point is precisely then to blow up, so to speak, you know, scale up radically from that discrete event to the entire world and the distribution of all the people on the planet. And to say, this is a, an event that symbolizes something of perhaps world historical significance. And of course, there's no way of knowing which household, which baby, which migrant family actually tips that statistical balance between a more rural humanity and a more urban humanity. But it's a powerful way of dramatizing what is going on here, right? Or the, the sort of magnitude and significance of what the entire book is going to then try to unpack or reveal. So from a, it's not really an analytical thing he's doing as far as you know, analyzing the process, but it's a very good way of dramatizing what's going on here. And it's actually um, it's sort of a mark of the kind of, uh, th these types of scale, jumping between scale um, as a rhetorical or narrative device can be an extremely uh, potent way of sort of, of writing. Uh, the first couple years I taught this course, we read Guns, Germs, and Steel, Jared Diamond's very famous book. Um, we don't read it anymore because I'm actually not that fond of it. But if you, if you read it, one of the things he repeatedly does is just that kind of thing. He'll tell a little story based on his own experience talking with somebody somewhere and then expand it in terms of its significance or its, its uh, interpretive meaning um, out to much, much broader scales, even broader than the one that, that uh, Davis is doing here. Okay, who else? Yeah. Okay, you can, you, there's, oops, what happened here? There's, there's nothing to say, hey, there's nothing to say that you can only talk about events at the household scale and decades at the city scale, that kind of thing. I mean, we're, this is a schematic. It is possible to talk about something that's spatially discrete, like a particular neighborhood or a particular slum, and think about it over the scale of years or decades, right? So part of the discussion that Davis offers is examples of slums that have cropped up in some place and then gone through this series of being demolished and then rebuilt, demolished and rebuilt. Sometimes they're demolished by natural disasters. Other times they're demolished by bulldozers wielded by the military or the government in an effort to remove these people and replace them with some other kind of, of settlement. And that process plays itself out over typically many years, perhaps even decades. What else? Yeah. On the scale of decades and decades of years, you can see the birth rate cities are one that's rivers expanding out into rural regions. So okay. Okay, so if you expand out to the scale of like an entire metro region and look at it over years or decades, you can watch the growth, typically the growth, of the sort of urban footprint or the metropolitan footprint expanding out into the countryside. That's something that, you know, you can do that with remote sensing imagery. You can, you can go online and find the Landsat, you know, satellite pictures of cities from 1977, 1982, and so on and so forth, and, and watch that through time at that scale. What else? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we talked a little bit about this last time. What prevented the growth of slums before about 1950? What changed around then? And then we see this acceleration. And he identifies policies, you know, political positions, laws, practices enforced by colonial governments, the British and the French in Africa, for example, and also by the Chinese, the Soviet Union, to outlaw large-scale migration in various ways, or to set up rules about who could own property in the cities, and therefore who could sort of stay there. And those processes played themselves out typically over many decades. And they, yes, they were specific to each colony or each country, but they appear to have been a, pro a pro process or a, or a phenomenon that you can see in many, many parts of the world, particularly in what we identify as the second or third worlds um, in the sort of third world, first world, second world schema. Uh, we'll talk about that later in the semester. 